We're TTB, the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the TTB Bootcamp Webinar Series for Brewers, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Juliet Mello, and I'm a Malt Beverage Labeling Specialist at TTB, and I'm delighted to be your presenter today. In today's session, we'll be covering the key aspects of malt beverage labeling and how to ensure that your labels are in full compliance. Our goal by the end of this webinar is to ensure you leave with not only a clear understanding of the labeling approval process, but also the knowledge and tools to effectively navigate it. Without any further ado, let's begin. Before we dive into the details, please take a moment to review the following disclaimer. In summary, this presentation is designed to help you comply with TTV's regulations but it's important to remember that these regulations are subject to change. With that in mind, always check the latest laws for the most current information. Also, the examples we'll be using today are purely hypothetical, meant only for demonstration purposes. In today's session, we'll start with the Certificate of Label Approval Basics, or COLA for short. We'll then cover the mandatory information required on labels, followed by a brief overview of keg collars, prohibited labeling practices, and wrap up with a look at optional label claims. In the upcoming slides, we'll dissect the what, who, why, when, and how of COLAs, providing you with a complete picture of its role and relevance in malt beverage labeling. So what is a COLA? A COLA is your official authorization or green light for bottling and distributing malt beverages, as well as for releasing imported products from customs, provided the labels are compliant. The key here is to make sure your product's labels are an exact match to the approved COLA or have changes that are authorized by the certificate or TTB's public guidance. Also, please keep in mind that a COLA approval does not protect your product's trademark. To apply for label approval, you need to have one of two things, either a brewer's notice or a basic permit if you're an importer. These permits and notices are issued by the TTB's National Revenue Center located in Cincinnati, Ohio. For more information or assistance, you can use permits online, call the number provided, or utilize their contact form on TTB's website. So why is a COLA needed? Under the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, or the FAA Act, obtaining a COLA is a standard requirement for malt beverage bottlers and importers. Essentially, a COLA acts as a safeguard to ensure that products are legally compliant before they hit the market and become available to consumers. So when should you apply for label approval? You need to secure COLA before you start bottling your product if it's domestically produced or before removing it from customs if it's imported. Also, bottling here refers to all forms, including cans and kegs. As a friendly piece of advice, hold off on printing those labels until your COLA is approved. It might be tempting to jump the gun when you're on a tight schedule, but doing so can create a variety of issues in the long run. Lastly, for an idea of how long the COLA process takes, visit our website at the provided link for the current processing times. Now let's talk about when a COLA isn't necessary. This typically applies to products that don't align with the FAA Act's definition of a malt beverage. This means if your beer isn't made with both malted barley and hops, it falls outside this definition and doesn't require a COLA. See TTB ruling 2008-3 for more information on this. Instead, these products fall under FDA's or the Food and Drug Administration's labeling regulations. Additionally, sake, often treated as beer in terms of production and tax, is actually categorized as wine for labeling if its alcohol content exceeds 7%, which means it follows a different set of labeling rules. Another instance where COLA may not be needed is if you're selling your malt beverages solely within the state they were produced. However, this can vary based on state laws. For example, if the product is bottled and sold in Florida only, 
then TTB would not require COLA. However, some states may. Therefore, we strongly recommend consulting with your state and local authorities to fully understand the specific requirements that apply to your situation. Now we'll discuss what needs to appear on your label even when a COLA is not required. The first being a key element on all labels, which is the health warning statement, or also known as the government warning statement. Secondly, for those brewing in the US, there are specific markings that must appear on your product's label. Lastly, depending on your brewing ingredients and processes, a formula approval may be required. We'll go into more detail on these points as we move along. Once you're ready to apply for label approval, the first step is to register for an account with Colas Online. This platform is designed to help you through the submission process. Equipped with features like detailed instructions, validation checks to keep you on track, and delivers updates straight to your email inbox. Also, please note that for security reasons, password sharing is not permitted, as each COLA applicant is required to have their own individual account. Can you modify your approved label without applying for a new COLA? Absolutely. This ties back to those authorized changes we discussed earlier. Once your label receives TTB approval, you are allowed to change certain items on that label without submitting for a new COLA. You can find this list of allowable revisions on TTB's website, as well as the Allowable Changes Sample Label Generator, which is a helpful tool that illustrates examples of allowable changes to approved labels based on the information provided. Also, please be sure to keep a record of the corresponding COLA for each label. In the event that TTB requests proof to confirm that your label changes are covered by an existing COLA. Now that we've covered the COLA basics, we'll shift our attention to the mandatory information that must be present on your malt beverage label. This slide entails and details the mandatory information that needs to be included on malt beverage labels, along with the specific regulations that apply. An important thing to note is that the alcohol content must be listed on labels of malt beverages with added alcohol from flavors or other additives. Otherwise, it's optional. Unfortunately, we will not go into ingredient declarations and labeling for imports in this session, but you can access detailed guidance on these topics on TTB's website. Additionally, a link to these resources will be shared in the resource slide at the conclusion of our presentation. Moving on to the general layout requirements. The main takeaway here is readability. It's essential that all mandatory text is clearly visible against the background. While the brand name can be in any language, remember that all other mandatory information must be in English, except for products intended for Puerto Rico where Spanish is also acceptable. If you wish to include foreign language phrases, ensure they do not conflict or mislead when compared to the mandatory text. Additionally, a translation should be noted in the special wording section of the COLA or attached to your application if it's not directly translated on the label. Furthermore, to ensure compliance with type size requirements, please refer to the guidance provided in TTB's Beverage Alcohol Manual for Malt Beverages or the regulatory citation noted on the slide. Here we have a practical example of a compliant malt beverage label and a part of the COLA for context. The numbers on the left correspond to those on the images. As a quick overview, we'll begin with number one, the brand name, noted as example, and you'll notice both the label and the application match. Number two, the bottler's name and address, are listed as fake brewery name, Arlington, Virginia. While we only require the city and state, including the full address is completely fine. Number three, the class and type is classified as golden ale. Number four, the net contents is correctly stated as one pint, 0 0.9 fluid ounces. Number five, the government warning statement is displayed on the back label and is compliant in terms of punctuation, spelling, and format. And number six, the alcohol content. For this product, listing the alcohol content is optional, 
since it's made with standard brewing ingredients. Remember, it is only mandatory for products with added non-beverage alcohol ingredients. However, always check state laws as they might require alcohol content disclosure, even if TTB does not. You'll also notice the label features optional elements like product information, a UPC, and more. Lastly, all mandatory information is clearly legible against the background maintaining readability, as mentioned earlier. The first element of mandatory label information we'll cover is the brand name. A brand name is how your product is known and marketed. In cases where a brand name isn't provided, the bottler or importer's name is considered to be the brand name. We'll explore this further in the next slide. Mistakes we tend to see include having a brand name on the label that doesn't match the application or using the class and type as the brand name on the application. As seen in the following example, ale alone is not sufficient. The same goes for stout, porter, etc. However, pairing the class and type with an additional descriptor, for example, Duke's ale or Milo's porter, would mitigate this. Essentially, the class and type designation cannot be stated by itself when it comes to the brand name field of the COLA application. Moving on to a related point, it's important to understand the nuances of a conditionally approved status. This status emerges when your application and label don't quite match up. In such instances, a TTB specialist may suggest modifications aimed at resolving these inconsistencies. Once these recommendations are made, your application status shifts to conditionally approved. This signifies that your label's approval is pending and contingent upon your review and acceptance of TTB's suggested changes. To expand on this further, once you receive a conditionally approved status, it's crucial to carefully review the proposed changes. You then have the option to either accept the changes for instant approval of your COLA or decline the changes and apply your own corrections, then resubmit as usual. Take, for instance, an application specifying ALE as the brand name. If you recall, in the previous example on the brand name slide, ALE by itself is not sufficient in which case the bottler or importer's name would be regarded as the default brand name. In this scenario, a TTB specialist would replace ALE with the appropriate name, mark the application as conditionally approved, and send it back to you for your review. Please keep in mind that this feature applies only to the brand name and fanciful name fields of the application. We'll explore the topic of fanciful names in the slides ahead. Next, we'll shift our focus to the specifics regarding the name and address statement. As mentioned earlier, the city and state of the bottler is all that is required. However, you're free to include the full street address, just be sure it aligns with the information on your application. Utilizing a trade name or a doing business as name is also permissible. For those with multiple brewing locations, there are two options for detailing your label's name and address. You can choose to display the address of your main operational site, or also known as the principal place of business, or you may choose to list every location, provided each receives equal emphasis and meets the coding and specific marking requirements we briefly touched upon earlier. Regarding the name and address on labels, there are a few common mistakes to be aware of such as the label is either missing the name and address entirely or the information noted does not match the application. In the context of contract brewing, the contract D's DBA or trade name is absent from the brewer's notice. It is also common to see labels mistakenly display the name and address of the contract D, the company for which the product is being made for, rather than that of the actual contract brewer or the company producing bottling the malt beverage. Next, we'll talk about the net content statement. It can be displayed on the label or incorporated into the container during the manufacturing process through methods like blowing, embossing, or molding. This is commonly seen with PEG label submissions. 
The net contents must be stated in English units of measure, such as fluid ounces, pints, quarts, or gallons. You're allowed to include metric measurements as shown in the following example of 750 milliliters, but they must accompany not replace the US customary unit. And both should appear within the same field of vision on the label. When it comes to net content labeling, there are a few mistakes you'll want to avoid. These include using incorrect abbreviations and formats or not including the right conversions. For example, instead of simply stating 16 ounces or 16 fluid ounces on a label, it should be correctly expressed as one pint. Additionally, other formats like one pint, 16 fluid ounces, or one pint, 473 milliliters are also acceptable. Turning our attention to alcohol content, there are two common standards, alcohol by volume and alcohol by weight. Remember, the alcohol content is mandatory only if the malt beverage contains added alcohol from flavors, such as vanilla extract or other non-beverage ingredients. Otherwise, it's optional unless required by state law. Alcohol by weight, on the other hand, is always optional. But if included, it should be presented alongside the alcohol content statement. For acceptable abbreviations and formats for these two standards, please refer to the chart on the slide. A few key points to remember in order to avoid common alcohol content related mistakes are be mindful of the format, avoid using abbreviations like ABV or ABW. As an example, a label stating 5% ABV would not be compliant and would require correction. Additionally, if the term alcohol by volume is used on the label, ensure it is fully spelled out and includes the percent symbol. Last but not least, always remember to list the alcohol content for beverages with added alcohol from flavors or non-beverage ingredients. Now we'll briefly go over the criteria for the health warning statement. To summarize, it must be clear, easily readable, and set apart from other text. It should contain correct punctuation, capitalization, and spelling. For example, the SNG in Surgeon General must be capitalized. Lastly, the header must be bold and distinct from the rest of the text as shown here. A tip we often recommend to brewers is to copy the statement directly from TTB's malt beverage labeling page and save it somewhere accessible, like your desktop, for easy reference and to ensure you're maintaining the correct format on each of your label submissions. In the upcoming slides, we're gonna cover class and type designations for various malt beverages, including non-flavored, flavored exempted, and specialty products. The class and type designation you choose for your malt beverage should be an accurate representation of your product, consistent with industry standards and the product's typical characteristics. Designations such as ale, beer, malt liquor, stout, and porter are acceptable, but they must truthfully represent the identity of your product. In this slide, we'll take a look at common class and type labeling mistakes and use these examples of non-compliant labels for context. Starting from the left and beginning with number one, the acronym IPA by itself isn't a recognized class and type. It needs to be accompanied by a full designation like ale, beer, or India Pale Ale somewhere on the label. Number two, on keg labels, simply using beer followed by a colon is not adequate. The class designation must be fully stated. Again, it can be ale, stout, porter, etc. Number three, for styles like Hefeweizen, it's necessary to include a qualifier such as ale or beer somewhere on the label because it is not sufficient as a class designation by itself. In this next segment, we'll explore class and type designations for malt beverages exempt under TTB ruling 2015-1. This ruling exempts certain ingredients like fruits and spices from formula approval and outlines specific guidelines for aging beer. 
What this means is you can use these exempt ingredients or aging processes without needing a pre-review of your recipe and production process by TTV. For such exempt products, there are two ways to label the class and type. Option one, adequate designation. This approach directly modifies the class and type with the flavor or ingredient. For example, as shown in the table on this slide, a product containing raspberry puree, which is exempt, can be labeled as fruit ale or raspberry ale. Option two, statement of composition or SOC, this format is more descriptive, starting with the malt base like ale, followed by the added ingredients such as with natural flavor or with raspberries. It's also important to note that fanciful names and aging process details are optional. For example, if the statement of composition is ale with raspberries aged in bourbon barrels, excluding the aged in bourbon barrels portion from the class and type designation, thereby simplifying it to ale with raspberries is perfectly fine, and both versions would be considered compliant. In addition to the actual ruling, TTV ruling 2015-1 is accompanied by two important attachments. Attachment one is where you'll find a comprehensive list of 88 ingredients and their specific forms that are exempt from formula approval. For instance, raspberry puree is considered exempt, but raspberry extract would require a formula. Attachment two, as presented on the slide, offers practical scenario-based guidance. It includes examples of adequate designations, SOCs, and common pitfalls to avoid. Together, these attachments are helpful tools providing detailed guidance and clarity, especially if you're considering adding flavoring materials to your malt beverage product. To illustrate what we've covered so far, Let's take a look at the following label example. As noted earlier, the ingredient raspberry puree is exempt under TTV ruling 2015-1. The label on the left is not compliant as it fails to include a class and type designation as required by the ruling. On the right side, we see examples of acceptable class type designations and statements of compositions that conform to TTV's regulations. These include ale with raspberries, fruit ale, or raspberry ale. When labeling formula exempt malt beverages, be aware of these common errors. Simply using style names such as Goza or Wit may not provide enough information about the ingredients. For instance, the name Wit doesn't automatically imply the presence of typical ingredients like coriander seeds or orange peel. Failing to include a statement of composition, SOC, or an appropriate designation is another common pitfall to avoid. Lastly, not including the base product at the start of the SOC. The statement should begin with the base like ale or porter, stout, etc., followed by the added ingredients, as seen with the example ale with blueberries. The next class and type category we will cover are malt beverage specialty products. These products stand apart from traditional categories like beer or ale, often due to the use of added flavors, colors, or specific non-exempt ingredients or ingredients or processes. For these specialty products, formula approval is typically required. The formula is submitted via a separate platform called Formulas Online. This process involves TTB reviewing the product's ingredients and production methods, essentially evaluating its recipe. To determine if your product needs formula approval, you can use our Which Alcohol Beverages Require Formula Approval tool that is available online. For specialty products, the class and type are defined by two elements, the fanciful name and the statement of composition. The fanciful name is a creative and distinctive name, while the SOC breaks down the product's ingredients. Starting with the malt base, followed by the listing of any added flavoring material. Take the following example. Hazelnut Delight is the fanciful name, and the SOC reads Porter Brewed with Hazelnuts. 
it's important that these two elements are presented together on the label in order to adequately represent the class and type of the specialty product. When labeling malt beverage specialties, pay attention to these common labeling mistakes. Ensure the fanciful name used is exactly the same on both the label and the application to avoid any discrepancies. The statement of composition should be complete and accurately represent the flavoring materials as specified in the formula. It's essential to always include the base beer in the statement. Proper labeling should clearly state the base like ale with vanilla extract rather than an incomplete statement such as made with vanilla extract. To further illustrate the key lessons from our previous slides, let's review a before and after scenario of a malt beverage label. It's important to note that elderberries are not on the exempt list and therefore would require formula approval. The label on the left has two, prim two primary issues. The SOC is not compliant as it fails to mention the malt base and the fanciful name, which is mandatory for specialty products and noted on the coal application is absent from the label. On the right side, we see the rectified label in which happily elder after is now correctly displayed as the fanciful name consistent with the cola application and the SOC ale with elderberries is now fully compliant and both elements appear together on the label. As we wrap up our discussion on class and types, let's consider the role of geographical names. These names refer to the origin, location, or region associated with a product. In cases where the product is not produced in that location, then the label needs qualifiers like style or clarifying language like product of the USA to accurately indicate where the product is made. Common labeling errors include naming products India Pale Lager or India Session Ale without the necessary India style or India type qualifiers, leading to potential confusion about the product's origin. Additionally, it's important to ensure that phrases like product of the USA or similar clarifications are placed in proximity to the geographical reference on the label to avoid to avoid misleading consumers. In malt beverage labeling, the use of geographical names can vary based on their current significance. On the left column, we have names of malt beverage types that have become generic over time. This means these names no longer require geographical qualifiers, regardless of where the product is made. However, the names on the right, like Belgian, Irish, or West Coast, still hold their geographical significance. For example, a product labeled as West Coast Pale Ale but brewed in New York should be labeled as West Coast Style Pale Ale or include a Product of New York qualifier. Please keep in mind that this is not a complete list and other designations may also require qualification. As we conclude this section on geographic significance, Let's take a look at this label example. The left label reads India Pale Lager. Unlike the term India Pale Ale, India Pale Lager has not become generic and still holds geographic significance. Therefore, using it without a qualifier is considered misleading and in need of correction. In the corrected version on the right, India Pale Lager is appropriately labeled with a qualifier, product of USA. This addition clarifies the actual production location, aligning with the guidelines we discussed earlier. In this next segment, we will cover the key details that should be included on keg collars to ensure they are fully compliant with all mandatory labeling requirements. Like bottles and cans, kegs are consumer containers and must comply with mandatory labeling requirements when a cola is needed. The mandatory information can be displayed in various ways, including on keg caps, collars, stickers, or a combination of. You may include handwritten information on these labels, but it's important to ensure that the government warning statement is always pre-printed. Now we'll cover the requirements for keg labels. It's essential these labels are securely affixed and not easily removable. For kegs with a capacity of at least 5.16 gallons, 
Labels are considered properly affixed if they are designed to break or cannot be reused when removed, or if the container has a permanent or semi-permanent marking of the bottler or importer statement via engraving or printing. Lastly, the government warning statement would, must always be firmly affixed on all kegs with no exception. Let's review some typical errors found on keg labels and how to fix them. Starting with number one, we often see punctuation mistakes when it comes to the government warning statement, such as the S and G in the Surgeon General are not capitalized and a comma is missing after general and machinery. Number two, while having multiple class type designations is fine, one must be clearly selected. Leaving all checkboxes blank would require correction. Number three, if the alcohol content section is blank, either remove it if it's not mandatory or fill in the correct value, like 5%. Number four, this is a two-part mistake. One being Irish ale needs a qualifier like style due to its geographical significance. And number two, names like Axel Cream and Plain Wit need a class type addition, such as ale or beer. The right side of the slide shows a label that has been corrected accordingly. In this section, we'll cover prohibited labeling practices. These practices include any statements or claims on labels that could be misleading to consumers. Malt beverage labels must be truthful and avoid any misleading or false claims. Here's what to watch out for. Do not make claims or guarantees that are not supported by your products. Avoid making negative or misleading statements about competitors' products. Avoid suggesting health benefits such as improves heart health. Never imply government endorsement, endorsements that haven't been given. Avoid suggesting that the product contains distilled spirits. For example, when mentioning barrel aging, be careful not to overemphasize the distilled spirits component, like highlighting or enlarging the word rum in ale aged in rum barrels. Lastly, labels should not contain any obscene or indecent content. By steering clear of these practices, you'll ensure your malt beverage labels are compliant and not misleading. In addition to the mandatory labeling requirements, there are optional claims that may appear on your malt beverage label. In this slide, we have compiled a list of resources that provide detailed guidance on each of these optional claims. Optional label claims include, but are not limited to, information on representing caloric and carbohydrate content, gluten content statements, and nutrient content claims. These resources will aid you in making well-informed choices about the optional information you may want to add to your malt beverage label. As we wrap up the main portion of our presentation and prepare to move into the resources section, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this webinar series. We hope the information shared has been both informative and beneficial for your labeling endeavors. With that being said, we would love to hear your feedback on today's session, so please don't hesitate to share them by scanning the QR code provided on the slide. Throughout today's discussion, we've highlighted a variety of websites and tools that are instrumental for navigating the ins and outs of malt beverage labeling. For your convenience, this slide compiles all those mentioned resources, presenting them as direct links for quick and easy access. Before we conclude today's session, always remember TTV is here to help. If you have any questions or need further guidance, you are welcome to contact us via the toll-free number provided on this slide or submit your questions through our ALFT contact form. This concludes our presentation and we thank you once again for being part of our TTV Bootcamp webinar series for brewers. Have a lovely day. Visit TTB's official YouTube channel at USTTB.gov for more TTB-related content. And remember to click subscribe so you'll always know when we upload new videos.